Marcellus set out with his whole army and came to Syracuse. He proceeded to attack the city by land and sea, Appius leading up the land forces and he himself having a fleet of 60 ships filled with all sorts of arms and missiles. He directed an engine of artillery on a huge platform supported by eight galleys fastened together and with this sailed up to the city wall, confidently relying on the extent and splendor of his equipment and his own great fame. But all this proved to be of no account in the eyes of Archimedes and in comparison with the engines of Archimedes. To these he had by no means devoted himself as work worthy of his serious effort, but most of them were mere accessories of a geometry practiced for amusement. But when the Romans assaulted them by sea and land, the Syracusans were stricken dumb with terror. They thought that nothing could withstand so furious an onset by such forces. But Archimedes began to ply his engines and shot against the land forces of the assailants all sorts of missiles and immense masses of stones which came down with incredible din and speed. Nothing whatever could ward off their weight. At the same time, huge beams were suddenly projected over the ships from the walls, which sank some of them with great weights plunging down from on high. Others were seized at the prow by iron claws or beaks like the beaks of cranes, drawn straight up into the air and then plunged stern foremost into the depths, or were turned round and round by means of engineering within the city and dashed upon the steep cliffs that jutted out beneath the wall of the city, with great destruction of the fighting men on board who perished in the wrecks. Frequently too, a ship would be lifted out of the water into mid-air, whirled hither and thither as it hung there, a dreadful spectacle until its crew had been thrown out and hurled in all directions when it would fall empty upon the walls or slip away from the clutch that had held it. As for the engine which Marcellus was bringing up on the bridge of ships, while it was still some distance off in its approach to the wall, a stone of ten talents weight was discharged at it, then a second and a third. Some of these, falling upon it with a great din and surge of wave, crushed the foundation of the engine, so that Marcellus, in perplexity, ordered his ships to sail back as fast as they could, and his land forces to retire. And so then, in a council of war, it was decided to come up under the walls while it was still night, if they could. For the ropes which Archimedes used in the engines, since they imparted great impetus to the missiles cast, would, they thought, send them flying over their heads, but would be ineffective at close quarters where there was no place for the cast. Archimedes, however, as it seemed, had long before prepared for such an emergency engines with a range adapted to any interval. When, therefore, the Romans came up under the walls, thinking themselves unnoticed, once more they encountered a great storm of missiles, huge stones came tumbling down upon them almost perpendicularly, and the wall shot out arrows at them from every point. They therefore retired again. Marcellus made his escape, and jesting with his own artificers and engineers said, Let us stop fighting against this geometrical Briarius, who uses our ships like cups to ladle water from the seas, and with the many missiles which he shoots against us all at once, outdoes the hundred-handed monsters of mythology. For in reality, all the rest of the Syracusans were but a body for the designs of Archimedes, and his the one soul moving and managing everything. For all other weapons lay idle, and his alone were then employed by the city both in offense and defense. In the end, the Romans became so fearful, whenever they saw a bit of rope or a stick of timber projecting a little over the wall, they cried out, There it is! Archimedes is training some engine upon us, and turned their backs and fled. First freedom and then glory. When that fails, wealth, vice, corruption. The Roman Empire is said to have followed this path, and that downfall inspired Thomas Cole's fantastic 1830s paintings, The Course of Empire. This video has been sponsored by Displate Metal Posters, and they are a unique and stunning way to enjoy iconic images like the Course of Empire on your wall. They are magnetic and take less than 20 seconds to mount. Indeed, the mounting system includes a wall protective leaf that leaves no traces when removed. They have posters for whatever your passion is. Movies, gaming, comics, nature, music, 
anything. They also even have textured 3D posters, which are great fun. Indeed, new brands and new collections are arriving every week and will be with you in four to five days, both in Europe and the US. They're already great value, but you can get an even better deal by visiting displaycom forward slash Voices of the Past or using the discount code Voices of the Past to access my special discount. 22% off for up to two displates and then 33% off for three or more. Thanks to Displate for supporting history content on YouTube. When the Franks moved out of Jerusalem to take the cities of Syria, they promised the Bishop of Pisa large rewards if he would assist them. He agreed to their request and stirred up two others who dwelt on the coast to do the same, and then without any delay, equipped biremes and triremes and dromones and other fast-sailing ships amounting to 900, and sailed forth to meet them. He detached a number of the ships and sent them to pillage Corfu, Leucas, Cephalania, and Zakynthus. On hearing this, the emperor ordered ships to be furnished by all the countries under the Roman sway. He had a number built in the capital itself and would at intervals go round in a monoreme and instruct the shipwrights on how to make them. As he knew that the Pisans were skilled in sea warfare and dreaded a battle with them, on the prow of each ship he had a head fixed of a lion or other land animal made in brass or iron, with the mouth open and then gilded over so that their mere aspect was terrifying. And the fire which was to be directed against the enemy through tubes he made to pass through the mouths of the beasts, so that it seemed as if the lions and the other similar monsters were vomiting the fire. In this manner then the ships were prepared, he next sent for his general, newly returned from Antioch, and gave him these ships and named him their supreme head. They left the capital in the course of the month of April and sailed to Samos with the Roman fleet. There they disembarked and hauled the ships up on land in order to make them stronger and more durable by tarring them over. When the Pisans caught sight of them, they speedily arranged their fleet in battle order and wetted their mines as well as their swords for the fray. As the Roman fleet was drawing near, a certain Peloponnesian count Petrochites by name, and a very expert navigator, had his ship of a single bank of oars rowed very quickly against the Pisans directly he saw them, and he passed right through the midst of them like fire, and then returned to the Roman fleet. The Roman fleet, however, did not venture upon a regular sea battle with the Pisans, but made a series of swift, irregular attacks upon them. Landulf himself, first of all, drew close to the Pisan ships and threw fire at them, but aimed badly and thus accomplished nothing but wasting his fire. Then the man called Count Elimon very boldly attacked the largest vessel at the stern, but got entangled in its rudders, and as he could not free himself easily he would have been taken had he not with the great presence of mind had recourse to his machine, and poured fire upon the enemy very successfully. Then he quickly turned his ship round and set fire on the spot to three more of the largest barbarian ships. The barbarians now became thoroughly alarmed, firstly because of the fire directed upon them, for they were not accustomed to that kind of machine, nor to a fire which naturally flames upwards, but in this case was directed in whatever direction the sender desired, often downwards or laterally, and secondly they were much upset by the storm, and consequently they fled. That is what the barbarians did. The Indians were already moving forward in search of us. When we came up with them, every one had a large bunch of feathers on his head, the cotton cuirass on, and their faces were daubed with white, black, and red colours. Besides having drums and trumpets, they were armed with huge bows and arrows, shields, lances, and large broadswords. They had also bodies of slingers, and others armed with poles hardened in the fire. The Indians were in such vast numbers that they completely filled the bean fields and immediately fell upon us all sides at once, like furious dogs. Their attack was so impetuous, so numerous were the arrows, stones and lances with which they greeted us, that above seventy of our men were wounded in no time, and one, named Saldana, was struck by an arrow in the ear and instantly dropped down dead. But then our artilleryman Mesa made terrible havoc among them, standing as they did, crowded together and within reach of the cannon, so that he could fire among them to his heart's content. 
All this time, Cortes still remained behind with the cavalry, though we so greatly longed for that reinforcement. Indeed, we began to fear that some misfortune might also have befallen him. I shall never forget the piping and yelling which the Indians set up at every shot we fired, and how they sought to hide their loss from us by tossing up earth and straw into the air, making a terrible noise with their drums and trumpets, and their war whoop. In one of these moments, Cortes finally came galloping up with the horse. Our enemies, being still busily engaged with us, did not immediately observe this, so that our cavalry easily dashed in among them from behind. And when we, who were already hotly engaged with the enemy, spied our cavalry, we fought with renewed energy. The Indians, who had never seen any horses before, could not think otherwise than that horse and rider were one body. Quite astounded at this, to them so novel a sight, they quitted the plain and retreated to a rising ground. After this, we bandaged the wounds of our men with linen, which was all we had for that purpose. Those of our horses we dressed with melted fat, which we cut from the dead bodies of the Indians. Our swords had done the most carnage among them, though many were killed by our cannon. The fighting lasted for about an hour, and our enemies maintained their ground so well that they did not quit the field of battle until our horse broke in among them. Cortez, who profited by every circumstance, said smilingly to us, It appears to me, gentlemen, that the Indians stand in great awe of our horses, and imagine that these and our guns alone fight the battle. A thought has just struck me which will further confirm them in this notion. You must bring here the mare of Juan Sedeño, which foaled on board a short time ago, and fasten her here where I am now standing. Then bring me also the stallion of the musician Ortiz, which is a very fiery animal and will quickly scent the mare. As soon as you find this to be the case, lead both the horses to separate places, that the caziques may neither see the horses nor hear them neigh, until I shall be in conversation with them. All this was accordingly done. He likewise ordered our largest cannon to be heavily loaded with gunpowder and ball. And so a little after midday, forty caziques arrived in great state and richly clothed according to their fashion. They saluted Cortez and all of us, perfumed us with their incense, begged forgiveness for what had happened, and promised to be friendly for the future. Cortez answered them by our interpreter Aguila, reminding them with a very serious look how often he had wished them to make peace with us, and how, owing to their obstinacy, we were almost upon the point of destroying them with the whole of the inhabitants of this district. We were vassals of the mighty king and lord the emperor Charles, he further added, who had sent us to this country with orders to favour those who should submit to his imperial sway. If, however, they did not so, the Tepostals, so the Indians called our cannon, would be fired off, which were already embittered against them in some measure on account of the attack they had made upon us. Cortes, at this moment, gave the signal for firing our largest cannon. The report was like a sudden clap of thunder, the ball whizzing along the hills, which could be distinctly heard as it was midday and not a breath of air stirring. The Caziques, who had never seen this before, appeared in dismay and believed all Cortes had said, who, however, desired Aguilar to comfort and assure them he had given orders that no harm should be done to them. But at this moment, the stallion was brought and fastened at a short distance from the spot where Cortes and the caziques were holding the conference. As the mare was likewise near at hand, the stallion immediately began to neigh, stamp the ground and rear itself, while its eyes were continually fixed on the Indians who stood in front of Cortes's tent, as the mare was placed behind it. The caziques, however, thought the animal was making all these movements against them and appeared greatly agitated. When Cortes found what effect this scene had made upon the Indians, he rose from his seat and walking to the horse, took hold of the bridle and desired his servant to lead it away. Aguila, however, was to make the Indians believe that he had ordered the horse not to do them any injury. A lively discourse was now kept up between Cortes and the caziques, who in the end left us perfectly contented with the assurance that the following day they would return with a present. Sir, I have the honour to acknowledge having received your letter of the 5th, enclosing one from Mr. Haynes. 
The information therein contained is, I doubt not, substantially correct in general. One week ago, however, two deserters made known to me the whole project more in detail, confirming much that I had previously suspected. It seems there are ten Davids building in Charleston, similar to that which torpedoed the Ironsides. Of these, one is completed and ready for service, the others are in different stages, from the mere keel to an advanced stage. The Diver, as she is now called, is also ready, and with the original David is now at Mount Pleasant, on the lookout for a chance. The action of the Davids has been, of course, pretty well exemplified on the Ironsides, but that of the Diver is different, as it is intended to submerge completely, get under the bottom, attach the torpedo, haul off and pull trigger. So far, the trials have been unlucky, having drowned three crews of 17 men in all. Still, she does dive, as one of the deserters saw her pass twice under the bottom of the vessel he was in, and once under the Charleston. The diver can also be used as a David, so that there are really three of these machines ready to operate. On receiving this intelligence, I caused additional means of prevention to be used, as will be seen by copies of enclosed orders, and the department may be assured that if any of our monitors are injured, it will not be for lack of the utmost vigilance. There is, no doubt, much to be apprehended from these torpedoes, and I've already suggested to the department an extensive use of similar means. I again respectfully urge on your consideration the most prompt resort thereto. Nothing better could be devised for the security of our own vessels, or for an examination of the enemy's position. The length of these torpedo boats might be about 40 feet, and 5 to 6 feet in diameter, with a high-pressure engine that will drive them to 5 knots. With the ample mechanical means of the North, it seems that in one month, five or six could be gotten into service. The deserters say that the rebels believe that their batteries will do as much damage if we attack, but rely chiefly on the torpedoes for defense and apply them in a variety of ways, at the bows of their ironclads, upon their davids, upon rafts which carry six of the sixty pounders in a line, and even their small boats are equipped to receive a torpedo. Sir, I much regret to inform the department that the USS Housatonic on the blockade of Charleston SC was torpedoed by a rebel David and sunk on the night of the 17th of February about 9 o'clock. From the time the David was seen until the vessel was on the bottom, a very brief period must have elapsed, so far as the executive officer can judge, and he is the only officer of the Housatonic whom I have seen. It did not exceed five or seven minutes. The officer of the deck perceived a moving object on the water quite near and ordered the chain to be slipped. The captain and executive officer went on deck, saw the object, and each fired at it with a small arm. But in an instant, the ship was struck on the starboard side between the main and mizzen masts. Those on deck near were stunned. The vessel began to sink and went down almost immediately. Happily, the loss of life was small. The enclosed printed orders will show the precautions which have been directed from time to time to guard the ironclads that lay inside the bar, and would naturally be the object of attack from their importance and proximity, and I also transmit copy of a communication to the senior officer outside of the same subject. I'm inclined to believe that in addition to the various devices for keeping the torpedoes from the vessels, an effective preventative may be found in the use of similar contrivances. I would therefore request that a number of torpedo boats be made and sent here with dispatch, length about 40 feet, diameter 5 to 6 feet, and tapering to a point at each end, small engine and propeller, an opening of about 15 feet above, and to float not more than 18 inches above water, somewhat as thus sketched. I've also ordered a quantity of floating torpedoes, which I saw tried here and thought promised to be useful. I have attached more importance to the use of torpedoes than others have done. Their effect on the Ironsides in October and now on the Housatonic sustains me in this idea. The department will perceive from the printed injunctions issued that I have been solicitous for some time in regards to these mischievous devices. I naturally feel disappointed that the rebels should have been able to achieve a single success mingled with no little concern, lest, in spite of every precaution, they may occasionally give us trouble. But it will create no dismay, nor relax any effort. On the contrary, the usual inquiry will be ordered, though the whole story is no doubt fully known. 
I desire to suggest to the department the policy of offering a large reward of prize money for the capture or destruction of a David. I should say not less than $20,000 or $30,000 for each. They are worth more than that to us. I have the honor to be, very respectfully, your obedient servant. We heard strange noises, and lumbering slowly towards us came three huge mechanical monsters such as we had never seen before. My first impression was that they looked ready to topple on their noses, but their tails and the two little wheels at the back held them down and kept them level. Big metal things they were, with two sets of caterpillar wheels that went right round the body. There was a huge bulge on each side with a door in the bulging part, and machine guns on swivels poked out from either side. A petrol engine of massive proportions occupied practically all the inside space. Mounted behind each door was a motorcycle type of saddle seat, and there was just about enough room left for the belts of ammunition and the drivers. I was attached to battalion headquarters and the colonel, adjutant, sergeant major and myself with four signalers had come up to the front line. From this position, the colonel could see his men leave the assembly trench, move forward with the tanks, jump over us and advance to the enemy trenches. As a new style of attack, he thought it would be one of the highlights of the war. While it was still dark, we heard the steady drone of heavy engines, and by the time the sun had risen, the tanks were approaching our front line, dead on time. The Germans must have heard them too, and although they had no idea what to expect, they promptly laid down a heavy curtain of fire on our front line. This had the effect of making us keep our heads down, but every now and again we felt compelled to pop up and look back to see how the tanks were progressing. It was most heartening to watch their advance, we were almost ready to cheer. But there was a surprise in store for us. Instead of going onto the German lines, the three tanks assigned to us straddled our front line, stopped, and then opened up a murderous machine gun fire, enfilading us left and right. There they sat, squat, monstrous things, noses stuck up in the air, crushing the sides of our trench out of shape with their machine guns swiveling around and firing like mad. Everyone dived for cover, except the colonel. He jumped on top of the parapet, shouting at the top of his voice, Runner, runner, go tell those tanks to stop firing at once. At once, I say. By now, the enemy fire had risen to a crescendo, but, giving no thought to his personal safety as he saw the tanks firing on his own men, he ran forward and furiously rained blows with his cane on the side of one of the tanks in an endeavor to attract their attention. Although, what with the sounds of the engines and the firing in such an enclosed space no one in the tank could hear him, they finally realized they were on the wrong trench and moved on, frightening the jerrys out of their wits and making them scuttle like frightened rabbits. One of the tanks got caught up on a tree stump and never reached their front line, and a second had its rear steering wheels shot off and could not guide itself. The crew thought it more prudent to stop, so they told us afterwards, rather than to keep going, as they felt they might go out of control and run on until they reached Berlin. But the third tank went on, flattening everything they thought should be flattened, pushing down walls and thoroughly enjoying themselves. Our lads coming up behind them, taking over the village, or what was left of it, and digging in on the line prescribed for them before the attack. This was one of those rare occasions when they had passed through the enemy fire, and they were enjoying themselves chasing and rounding up the jerrys, collecting thousands of prisoners and sending them back to our lines escorted only by pioneers armed with shovels. The four men in the tank that had got itself hung up, dismounted, all in the heat of battle, stretching themselves, scratching their heads, then slowly and deliberately walked round their vehicle inspecting it from every angle and appeared to hold a conference among themselves. After standing around for a few minutes, looking somewhat lost, they calmly took out from the inside of the tank a primus stove and, using the side of the tank as a cover from enemy fire, sat down on the ground and made themselves some tea. The battle was over, as far as they were concerned. <laughs> 